Um, so yeah, my name is Adrian Hon. Uh, I run a games company called Six of Start. Um, we make online games and story-like games and game-like stories for people like the BBC and Disney and uh, Channel 4 and the Zombies game as well. And um, I also write for The Telegraph about technology and I'm writing a book called The History of the Future in 100 Objects. And um, what I want to do is talk about something I've been thinking about a lot recently, which is about jobs and technology. And I want to take you on a three-part journey um, about that. But um, it's, it's quite a serious talk. Um, it's probably going to make some people unhappy. It's a good job that Joe's gone. Um, the, so I want to just talk about something completely different first. Um, because this is the second time I've spoken at a TED conference. The first time was about 11 years ago. And that's before there was any TEDx. Um, that's before they put the videos up online. And uh, I was 17. I was still at school. And I was really into Mars exploration, of all things. And uh, I was on a mailing list. And someone said, you know what would be great to get more people interested in Mars exploration? We should go and send someone to TED. It's this cool conference. And um, I, I thought, that sounds great. So I went to the TED.com, and I looked it up. And I thought, where do I go and apply where to speak? Because that's what I thought you did. You go and apply to speak at TED. Um, and so I sent them an email saying, I'm a 17-year-old guy who did x, y, and z. Um, can I speak at your conference? And then I hit send. And I looked at the rest of the website then, and I realized, wait a second, this is a conference with Nobel Prize winners and you know, people like that. And, uh, and I kind of felt like a bit of a dick, to be honest. Um, and, and I thought, well, you know, worst thing is he'll just like, ignore it. Um, the organizer will ignore it. And um, I mean, I did, there's a bit more stories. That, you know, it's not just like I said, can I speak at your conference? Um, and about Two weeks later, I got an email saying, what's your mailing address? What's your home address? And uh, I said, this is it. And I thought, maybe they're going to send me you know, some you know, goodies or whatever. And, um, and the next day, FedEx package is overnighted. And it's two tickets to Monterey in California and saying, yes, we'd like you to speak. And uh, when I got introduced um, at the conference, the guy said, get a load of the balls on this guy. He just emailed me saying, can he speak at the conference? Um, so, so the moral of the story there is uh, you should just ask for things. You know, the worst is that people will say no. Um, but uh, so, so to, to sort of go in a completely different direction, what I want to talk about is, is jobs. And I want to read out a speech um, given by David Cameron last year. Um, about the new tech city in London. And he said, uh, the world of business is changing at an astonishing rate. Insurgent companies are taking advantage of thousands of new innovations and millions of new customers to generate billions in revenue within a matter of years. This is where so much of the promise of new jobs and opportunities lie. So it sounds, sounds great. Um, those numbers have a lot of zeros in them. Um, if we believe David Cameron or, or a lot of people who've spoken about this, politicians, entrepreneurs, and economists, you know, we will return to economic growth by innovating and by having in the UK the sort of tech companies that we've all heard about that, that are making billions in, in revenues and profits. You know, just imagine if we had a Twitter or a Facebook or an Apple in the UK. That would solve our problems, surely. But um, let's take a closer look. Twitter, um, $7 billion. That's pretty cool. You would think that would be a real job creator. 650 jobs. Um, OK, so maybe VCs are just crazy, and it shouldn't be $7 billion valuation. Um, how about a company that makes real money? Facebook. $1 billion profit projected this year. 2,000 jobs. So it's bigger, but it's not huge. Um, OK, so what about a really big company um, that makes an actual physical product? You know, we all have MacBooks and iPhones here. So what about Apple? Um, Apple, $65 billion revenue, $14 billion profit, $75 billion of assets. You know, we all know the stories. It's got more money than the US government. It's bigger than various countries and so on in terms of market cap. 50,000 jobs. OK, so yeah, that's that's... That's got a lot of jobs. But let's make a comparison with the UK. Sainsbury's 
has, it's not a tech company, no one, no one talks about Sainsbury's, um, has less than half the revenue and less than a tenth of the profits of Apple. But it would take three Apples to employ the same 150,000 people that Sainsbury's employs. It would take 75 Facebooks or 230 Twitters. So, okay, I would rather work at Twitter than at Sainsbury's, but there aren't that many Twitters. You know, we have 2.5 million unemployed people in the UK right now, even if the UK had 1,000 companies like Twitter. With all their profits, and you know, great profits, it still wouldn't solve our unemployment situation. And it's precisely because of something that a lot of people don't really want to talk about, because you know, if you think about it, you kind of shy away from it. It's because innovation and software and technology, it's about doing more with less. It's not about creating jobs. It never was about creating jobs. Let me give you an example. Um, you might have heard about this. IBM's newest supercomputer last year, Watson, beat the best of the best Jeopardy quiz show champions in the US last year. Um, you know, can kind of pass natural language um, and sort of find out information quicker than smartest kids. You don't hear IBM saying how inefficient Watson is, that its inefficiency will create thousands of jobs. No, they made, they made Watson and they performed this stunt on TV so they can sell this same technology to companies that want to save money by eliminating what are now lower skilled jobs. So call center jobs, customer service jobs, simple copywriting jobs. And you know, when we go and read about companies and news, and I write about them every week, you know, it's not just things like this. There is a company that can go and um, has software that will uh, write sports reports automatically. Um, what it does is it goes and takes a baseball data in and it'll go and say, oh, it's a beautiful morning in Atlanta. You know, this, you know, this player, you know, he's on a hot streak at the moment. You know, he hit, you know, seven, well, I don't know anything about baseball. I'll stop the story there. But you can sort of, you can see that, you know, it's got an algorithm that, uh, that generates a story. And it's not as good as the best sports writers, but it's better than the worst. And it costs about $1 per article. That's not going to create any jobs. Technology is about labor saving. For every, for every invention we make, whether it's a calculator or online shopping or self-checkout tills we see these days or driverless cars or iPhones, you know, we eliminate jobs. That's the point. Inventions are supposed to save time and labor. That's why people pay for them. And I suppose the idea is that we all gain from the wealth that these new inventions create and that the people who lost their jobs, you know, whose jobs are no longer needed, can simply retrain into a role that has more demand, a better role, like programming or engineering, maybe, not humanities. Um, <laughs> but we all know that it's not actually that easy to learn a new speciality. You know, you, you can't just click your fingers and tell people to retrain. It's quite hard. Um, of course, you could say people should go into manufacturing, but you know, even that is starting to employ fewer people. Yes, there's a flight of capital to China and to Asia, but even there, they're having problems. Even there, they're having unemployment problems in time. In fact, as things are changing so quickly, the entire classes of jobs seem to be disappearing every year. And the sad thing is that people think that people kind of associate unemployment with a sort of moral failing. Um, you know, if you see someone, you hear about unemployed students or things like that, you think, well, you know, they're too lazy, they didn't work hard enough in school, they don't deserve to be employed, so they don't deserve our sympathy or help. Um, you know, it's easy to kind of say that when you don't know them, but it's a bit different now. I think everyone probably knows people who are unemployed. And so this takes me to this kind of cryptic acronym that I use at the start, ZMP. I'm some, does anyone know what that means? No? Great. Um, <laughs> it stands for Zero Marginal Product Workers. And it came from an observation that over the last few years in the US, US economic output 
became slowly was recovering, it was going up, but not employment. So they've got a smaller number of workers, but making just as much stuff as before. So what's happening? Well, someone thought, well, clearly the people who got laid off didn't actually do anything at all. Um, they created zero marginal product. They were zero marginal product workers. Now, this idea is not really wholly accepted in economics. A lot of criticisms that it doesn't measure everything. But, you know, the, the thing is that ZMP is kind of a seductive argument because I think we all believe that, you know, we all work in, some people work in big companies, some people work in small companies. You all think that there are people out there who don't seem to do anything at work. You know, you know who I mean. Um, <laughs> yet at the same time, there's kind of another twist to this because, you know, they can't all be, you know, not everyone who got employed can be people who did nothing at all. You know, we all know smart, hard-working people who've been unemployed for months. One of the best game designers I've got on my team was unemployed for a year before he came on board. It's crazy. You know, we don't think that they're useless from an economic viewpoint. It just seems crazy that people could be out of work for so long. But, uh, you know, I couldn't get Muhammad Ali into this. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but Bertrand Russell will have to do. Um, so, now, recessions and productivity uh, and changes in productivity and unemployment, they're, they're not new things. They've been around for a while. We've had labour-saving invention for centuries. And actually, Bertrand Russell touched on this very well. And I'm just going to read out one of his thought experiments. He said, suppose that at a given moment, a certain number of people are engaged in the ma manufacture of pins. These guys, they make as many pins as the world needs, working, let's say, for eight hours a day. And then someone makes an invention. Let's say it's a machine by which the same number of men can make twice as many pins. And, you know, there's no need for any extra pins, so really the question is what happens? So in a sensible world, he says, everyone concerned in the manufacturing of pins would take to working four hours instead of eight, and everything would go on just the same. But in the actual world, this would be thought too demoralizing. So the men still work eight hours, there are too many pins, some employers go bankrupt, and half the men previously concerned in making pins are thrown out of work. And so there is, at the end, just as much leisure as in the other plan, but half the men are totally idle, while half are overworked. And in this way, it's ensured that the unavoidable leisure shall cause misery all around instead of being a universal source of happiness. Can anything more insane be imagined? Um, maybe. Uh, so, the fact is, though, in some countries, um, people have got around this with job sharing. Um, particularly in Scandinavian and Northern European countries. Job sharing is on the rise, and they are effectively working four hours instead of eight hours. Um, and I think it's better than the alternative. But, you know, not everyone's doing it. But, you know, I don't think job sharing is actually the whole answer here, because eventually we make so many inventions that they're just too few jobs to spread around. I suppose everyone could just sit around being totally idle. But it doesn't really seem like a recipe for happiness to me. I think that even if you just had four hours or two hours or how many hours extra, every day, for free. The route to happiness would involve being productive in some way, some other way that engages you, some other way that people want to pay you for. Of course, that's uh, easier said than done. The problem is that we're very rarely able to do that due to our educational system that kind of really funnels people through. We just have one or two chances to, like, to pick the career that you want. I still remember my friends at school doing their GCSEs and trying to work out what GCSE should I pick you know, to sort of have this career. I thought, you're only like 14. How could you possibly know what would make you happy in the future? But that's kind of what you've got to do. You've got to get the right GC, G GCSEs to get the right A-levels, to go to the right university and do the right course. It seems utterly insane to me. Um, and, you know, due to the difficulty right now of raising capital or getting loans, you know, you can't just get money to start up a new business in that spare time that you've got. And finally, due to a welfare system, you can't actually sit around you know, that much for four hours doing nothing. I mean, people like to say that, you know, you, you have a great time, but it's not really true practice. So if you're really unlucky and you're in this situation, you don't find a job. If you're slightly unlucky, you get a boring job. And if you're really lucky, then you get to work in some kind of creative industry 
which you know is a bit harder to replace by computers. And you know, I meet a lot of people in the media and advertising industries, you know, which you would think would be a great job because you sort of go and get to think of things, you get to be creative. But you know, it seems to me that all those guys actually really want to be writing books or making films or designing games. So, so why aren't they? And well, I, like I said before, it takes money to make a film or design a game. And right now, the problem is that there's only a few places where you can actually get money from. I mean, you don't need a lot of money, but you still do need some money. You've got to eat. And so these days, you know, you've got to go to a games publisher, you've got to go to a newspaper, or a bank, or the government. Let's say you get that. You have to go and convince some overworked or overlobbied commissioner that you have a good idea. And then you have to go and get distribution and convince them to take a punt on you. So despite the fact that we're supposed to live in a free market, it's kind of not really true. Um, final part, and I've got two and a half minutes, so I'll go fast. Um, creative debt. Now, things are changing. It used to be that you'd have to go through a lot of, well, a few gatekeepers to go and get anything made, to go and start a business or do a new project. And you can get money from crowdfunding places like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And, uh, you know, if you, if you have enough friends or you've got a good enough idea, it can work. And once you've made your project, whether that's a book or a film or a physical product or whatever, instead of having to go around to a ton of different shops and convince them to stock your product, you can just go straight to Amazon or iTunes or wherever and self-publish, which is great. Um, it's the future. Uh, you know, increases efficiency, sort of levels a playing field. But, you know, thinking ahead, another step, it has a bad side effect. Because one of the most useful things that publishers do and did was that they distributed risk. They would use a product, profit, from a really successful book like Harry Potter and use it to fund riskier projects that maybe on their own wouldn't have the chance to get made. But, you know, if, you're go if you don't have publishers anymore and people are going straight to market, JK Rowling goes straight to market, she just takes all her money, doesn't have to give any of it away, it's you know, not so great. Maybe you think that's, maybe you think that's fine. Maybe you, think, maybe you think she should be able to do that. But I think overall, it's not healthy. It doesn't, it doesn't really help overall creativity. So I don't think crowdfunding on its own is enough. I think that if you've got the fortune, this is kind of getting to moral ending, if you've got the fortune to have a big hit, you've got to figure out some way of passing on your fortune. And here's why, from a creative point of view. Anyone who's creative often gets asked, where do you get your ideas from? As if they just sort of you know, came down from the sky. The answer is simple. We just take them from each other. We get them from the books we read from each other, from the films we see, from all the games and articles that we read over years. And so we owe a creative debt to one another. And I think there's a moral obligation for artists and for creative people and for everyone to kind of share in their fortune and to pass it on. And, you know, I've actually stolen this idea myself from a guy called Lewis Hyde, who wrote a book called The Gift. And I think it recognises the importance of the gift economy of cooperation over simple greed. Because I think this is ultimately about where innovation and technology and software have brought us. They've made us so productive, so wealthy, that we're actually finding it hard to create work for ourselves. And yet we kind of help, we hate it when we see that people aren't working. And like Bertrand Russell's factory, we have now millions of people out of work. It's not a cause of celebration. People need jobs, not just for the money, but for self-respect and for happiness. And, you know, I'm afraid I can't really lift on an uplifting note here. There is no quick fix. There is no techno technological solution. There's no way for me to turn this all into a game that, you know, will solve it all. It just comes down to each of us helping each other in big ways and small by repaying that debt person by person, project by project. And I think on a bigger scale, we need to recognise where technology is taking our society and make sure that it works for us and not the other way around. Thank you.